Hello, I'm Suresh Shankar, founder and CEO of Crayon Data. Welcome to the first episode of my new podcast, Slaves to the Algo, or How to Stay Relevant in the Age of AI. In this episode, I will share my views on the new age of relevance and how every person on the planet wants to be celebrated for her or his individuality. Let me start with the age of relevance. Relevance has always been the holy grail for marketers. Here's a staggering fact. Consumer research conducted by Harvard and Accenture showed that in the US alone, companies lose $1 trillion of revenue annually to their competitors simply by not being consistently relevant enough. Relevance is also no longer about just being the benchmark in your own industry or in comparison to your competitors. Once a consumer is impressed by a highly relevant, personalized, responsive approach from one brand, they bring those expectations to all the experiences that they expect from all brands in all categories. But what does being relevant really mean? It isn't a new word. We try to be relevant to our customers all the time. It's just not a word that we've used a lot. A simple definition of relevance is the state of being appropriate given the context and meeting the requirements of the customer given the moment. And HBR study on the age of relevance talks about the evolution of marketing over the decades from mass marketing to segmentation to customer lifetime values. The 2010s was the age of loyalty, use CRM, tailored incentives, advanced retention techniques. The same study says that we are now entering the age of relevance mass communication to the much sought after and spoken about, but previously unattainable segment of one. And in this age of relevance, marketing has evolved from the traditional four P's, product, promotion, place, and price, to a new set of five P's. Purpose, the need to feel that the company shares my values and advances them. Pride. The need for me to feel proud and inspired to use the company's products and services. Protection. The need for me to feel secure when doing business with the company. Partnership. The need for me to feel that the company relates to and works well with other partners. And here are two examples. Let's start with purpose. Chobani, the Greek yogurt company that literally created the category and grew it into a billion dollar category, is a success. Yes, the yogurt tastes great. But more importantly, it resonates because it emphasizes the connection to an authentic food connection. In this case, you know, the Greek tradition of eating great yogurt. Uh, take pride, Patagonia, the sustainable clothing company. Their customers are people who literally believe in and fight for the environment. And therefore, they take pride in uh, purchasing and wearing Patagonia's products. But it is the fifth P in this new age of relevance that is driving the biggest change in marketing, personalization. The need for consumers to feel that my experience with the company is being constantly tailored to my needs, my priorities, my requirements in the moment. Let's face it, every person on the planet believes that she or he is unique. And every person also believes that companies treat her just the same as they treat everybody else or even worse, as a statistic. So how do you make billions of people, or let's say if you're a company with tens of millions of customers, feel that way as an individual? The good news is advances in data and analytics and AI make this possible today. You can offer personalization at scale. The best companies at doing this are the digital native platforms. They can easily create millions of AI-led personalized experiences for individual customers through the understanding that they have of those customers, their use of data and algos. They use it to deliver the most personalized experiences in the moment. Let me take an example of some a brand that you're familiar with, Spotify. Spotify has about 200 million customers and their catalog is about 140 or 150 million songs. So that literally means that there are 28 to 30 quadrillion choices that are possible. How do they make sure that for every one of those 200 million customers, they're delivering the right five or six songs in the context and the moment. How do they narrow it down? So they start by profiling. 
Spotify knows my taste in music. They know the kind of songs I listen to, the kind of songs I've saved, I've played, I've liked, I've repeated, my, what my friends have listened to, what's trending in the world. And they know that by actually extracting information on each song, they go beyond the artist and the genre, they understand what makes that song particularly liked by lots of people. Two, engage. Spotify uses my profile to engage me and keep me interested in discovering old tracks that I might like, new music, etc. Um, they personalize the recommendations. They have a Discover Weekly um, daily mix, uh, relevance, or I mean, a release radar. So they use all these different techniques. Uh, they know that my, what I listen to on a Monday morning may be different from what I do on a Friday evening or a, or a weekend. They don't always get it right, but they're always learning from the things I'm taking on and listening to or repeating. And third, transact. Spotify gets me through engagement to come back, use the app daily, spend more time on it, and hopefully upgrade from a free to a premium subscription to buying other things that they might want to sell me. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, yes, Spotify can do it, so can Amazon, so can any of these new digital companies. Why can't, if, why, why can't why can't a bank do that? Why can't an airline do that? Why can't a hotel or a retailer do that? What is it that prevents them from doing it? And the interesting thing is that it's not a lack of technology and it's not a lack of data or even a desire to do it. It's actually a problem with mindsets and attitudes. To succeed in this new era, marketers and businesses must be willing to let go of the old, abandon some of the legacy thinking in order to be able to embrace the new. It's the lack of willingness to transform a process or change a mindset that is more often the block. And let me share with you three examples of what I call legacy thinking. First, um, the idea of loyalty and loyalty marketing. Loyalty is dead. Consumers are just not loyal anymore. Organizations spend a lot of money on trying to ensure loyalty. Um, by one count, um, spends on this is about 25 to $30 billion a year. But according to recent research from Kantar Retail, 71% of consumers now claim that loyalty programs, incentives to make you stay loyal, don't make people loyal at all. And it's not hard to understand why, right? At, at, at its very basics, loyalty is a financial incentive. You know, if you buy 10 coffees, I'll give you the 11th one for free. If you, you know, come and shop with me and spend so much amount of money, I'll give you some, you know, I'll give you some discounts. But this is just financial bribery in a way. And when everybody is doing that and saying, I'll give you a deal and an offer, there really is no loyalty. There's a second step in this, which is something called a structural incentive, right? You create loyalty points like an airline does with their miles and people try and do that. I'm going to give you value over time. But again, uh, while these do have an influence on how people spend their money, the problem is everybody offers them. So when everybody is offering them and the switching cost in today's digital world, when I can just click through to another app in like milliseconds, the switching cost is so low that the structural bonds are no longer structural. What happens is that I can choose to go into one ride hailing app or a second ride hailing app, both of which will give me loyalty points and say, I'll give you some benefits. But, uh, you know, I just have to click through from one to the other. So where is the loyalty? I'm just going to look for what's right for me. And what's been shown is that the brands that win are the ones that provides the most relevant experience in the moment they will win. And for example, in the ride hailing hub case, if somebody is not able to get me a driver or if somebody is quoting some absurd price or if, um, you know, in some form or fashion, they're not able to give me what I want at that moment, I'm just going to use the competitor. So there really isn't any loyalty anymore. Let me come to the second fallacy, the idea that more is better. Let's give consumers more options. Let's get more offers. Let's give them more deals. The truth is uh, in the world today, there's too much choice. And 
relevance is not about providing more choice. It's actually about not wasting my time. It's about simplifying my options. When you simplify my options, you just become more relevant because otherwise I waste my time. And time is more valuable today than money in many ways. We all have a fair amount of money. We all have too much choice, but what we don't have enough of is time. In fact, more is less and less is more. There are enough studies that show that, you know, when you provide four to six highly, highly relevant and personal choices to people, they're not only happier with the choice, they actually make more choices. Now, this is not the same as not having a big catalog. You need a big catalog, but what you need is that you need to be able to narrow that catalog down into a small set of relevant choices that I make. For example, if Spotify only said I had a million songs, maybe I won't listen because I may not find what I want. But it's not the 140 million songs that I'm going to Spotify for. It's, the, it's their ability to provide me the right six to 10 songs that match my mood in the moment. The third example of legacy thinking is the approach that companies and professionals have towards AI and personalization. How do they use data, algos, and ecosystems? Let me start with data. There is literally no such thing as I have too much data. In general, the more data you use, the more sources they're from, the greater the variety of the types of data, the better your chances that you will be able to deliver a relevant prediction. But uh, more data also leads to more noise. And this is where the algorithm comes in. Clearly you need great algorithms to separate the signal from the noise. But the far harder mental challenge for most professionals is what do they expect from the algo? And I see two big fallacies. One is the need for more precision and the need for bigger lift. The two biggest questions I hear when I go and talk to people is, will the top prediction that your algo makes be right? Will the algo result in a big lift over my current way of doing things? Let me take each of these. So when you ask, let's say you ask Google to deliver you one search result or Amazon to deliver you one product, the chances are that Google and Amazon will not be able to meet that promise in spite of the vast amount of data and the great algos that they have. It is just too much pressure to be right and to focus on the mathematical value called precision. Instead, I think the focus needs to be on trying to ensure that from the basket, the top few choices, in Google's case, the top 10 search results they give you, in Amazon, the top six or seven products they're showing you in the page. From those top four to six choices, you must make sure the consumer is able to choose at least one of them. This is in mathematical terms called maximizing recall. And you may not get this right, but you know, if all those top four or six choices, you get the consumer to choose something, you learn with every interaction. The second uh, fallacy is this thing about, will it give me a big lift? Now, a big lift is typically defined as, you know, if I show this thing with, with the transaction, number of transactions go up. But there are many points in the journey between actually creating and, and the recommendation and actually making the purchase. And what I think the digital natives know is that a big lift is the cumulative impact of small changes at every step of that customer journey. First of all, am I surfacing the right message, whether it's on a mail or a notification or, or any kind of communication that I send to the customer? Are they clicking on that and opening it up? Are they clicking through and actually finding out something more about what you recommended? How much time are they spending? Are they trying to save it in a, in a cart? Are they trying to save it for later? And there's at least some seven or eight steps. And that's why engagement is a leading metric in terms of predicting relevance. And transaction is a lagging metric. The transaction happens at the end of the process. And I think the digital native companies are very good at saying that as I increase engagement with some small changes in every step of the journey, I'm going to get a much better outcome and a much bigger lift at the end of the process. If you want the final result without going through the steps, you're probably going to fail. And the third one is ecosystems. In general, the more ecosystems you link to, the more your personalization effort will improve. And by the way, it's also cheaper rather than trying to build everything yourself. 
you know, you know, you don't need to, you just need to be able to say, I'm going to be able to link to every one of those um, people who provide the choices that you want to deliver to your customer. I will spend some more time on these, um, on the data and the algos in the ecosystem. Some of these are deeply technical and mathematical topics, and I will do that in a separate episode. But let me end with this uh, very interesting statistic. Gartner in 2018 and 19 in their CMO spend survey showed that 14% of marketing budgets are going towards this personalization, this trying to ce celebrate people as individuals. Yet 74% of the same organizations said they're struggling to scale personalization. And I think that shows the difference between the digitally native and the digitally immigrant companies. One get this whole thing of how do I make every customer experience relevant in every interaction and another set of companies struggle with that. So what are our learnings out here? To be able to celebrate hundreds of millions of people as individuals, here are some things that your AI must do really well. The first profile, you must be able to understand your customers and their behavior and derive their underlying tastes and preferences from the data that you have, but also by using data from external sources and from anywhere that you can profile them better. Also use that to develop an affinity score or a taste match between every customer and the millions of products that they are likely to buy. Because that allows you to say, this is what every individual customer thinks about every song or, or every product that you want to sell them. Second, engage. Now you translate that profile into a series of richer engagement across various channels. You create intelligent, not just, you know, unified, but intelligent customer journeys across all of these channels. So that whenever the customer is interacting, he's always sensing that you're trying to stay relevant to them. And third, transact, which means be able to link them to the ecosystems, onboard a whole bunch of experiences from everybody that you want to try and tie up with so that the customer is able to get instant one-click fulfillment. Think about it this way. Spotify is able to say, I'm able to profile those 200 million customers in their days. I'm able to give them a great experience, no matter whether it's a Monday or a Wednesday or a, or a weekend. I'm able to also allow them to not just listen, but sometimes actually buy the music that they want to. That's, I think, literally what you need to be able to do. So let me wrap this episode up with a quick summary. This is the age of relevance. If you're not relevant, your business is going to slide into oblivion. Two, true relevance is individual relevance. You must be able to understand and engage millions of customers all at once. Three, this is possible. The data, the AI, the ecosystems exist. But four, and most critically, it probably involves getting rid of a lot of mental baggage, changing a lot of processes that you have in your company. So next up, in my next few episodes, I intend to talk to industry leaders and tech leaders to understand how they're using AI and data to stay relevant and to enable them to transform their businesses. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Slaves to the Algo or how to stay relevant in the age of AI. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to the podcast in the links in the description box below and do share this widely if you found it interesting. Once again, thank you, and I enjoyed bringing you this episode of Slaves to the Algo.